And if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Luke 1. Uh, one, one announcement that was not set up, but on the card, they have all these things. One important one was December 9th, it's a Saturday. We have our kids' quest. Bring yes. that. Bring that. Um, yeah. One thing I love about this church, when I first came here uh, and I was uh, visiting the church, they said, you got to come, not just to pre preach on a Sunday, you got to actually be here on a Wednesday. And, I, I, and people kept saying, like, are you scared yet? Like, and it's good because it means you guys, this church is awesome. Like, we're doing, we're reaching our community, right? We're doing it. And they, like, want to see, like, does that scare you, right? Because it's, um, it's, it's beautiful, a beautiful thing, reaching out to the children. So I, even if you're not involved in it, please keep praying for that ministry. Um, God, we have people in their church that have been, their lives have been changed because of what we do, reaching the children, right? And now they're adults. And we're getting the next generation. And we're going to see them come to know Jesus. Right. So um, let's uh, look at Luke 1, verse 39 and on. Um, as you go there, in the Gospel of Luke begins, and there's two visits of the angel, Gabriel. And he comes and he first tells um, Zechariah that his wife is going to become pregnant. And they're old and they're advanced in years and they can't have kids. And uh, he promises that they're gonna have, he's going to have a boy and they're going to name him John. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Then he goes to the town, a, a town of Nazareth to a, a, late, a young lady named Mary who doesn't have a husband and says, the Holy Spirit's going to conceive a baby in you um, and he's going to be son of the Most High. Right? And she's a relative of Elizabeth. So that's where we pick up now. The angel has told both these women that they're going to be um, uh, have babies. Both are miraculous births. And so um, uh, we'll pick that up in Luke 1, verse 39 and following. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her, in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in, the, in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in, re in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Um, I ask that uh, even as we've sung and worshipped you today, that you would be filling us as, as in the scriptures and the people are filled with your spirit, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us hearts that are rejoicing and overflowing. I pray that the message today, as we look at your word, would be truly uh, good news to us and cause us to sing, jump, leap, uh, dance for joy of what you have done. Um, so we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Joy. We all have experienced joy in our lives. The world gives us so much things to be joyful about. I think for me, when I think joy, that the, the purest joy that I can think of is I, I think of my nephew or my nieces, right? And just spending time with them. Or when they're a little baby, right? Uh, will look at you and smile, right? Or when one of my nieces is like real little, waddles over to you and kind of puts the hands up hold me, right? What joy, right? What joy? It's a, it's a, it's a, if you, you've experienced this, it's, it's just a joy that fills your heart, right? Um, and life is filled with joys, friendship, laughter. There's so much good. Joy, we know it. The, the greatest expression of joy, I, for me what I think of when we think of the expression, the outward expression of being joyful Perhaps the, the easiest example is sports. 
right? When your city wins the championship, right, that the players on the field jump and they just, just you know, maybe cry. They're not crying because they're sad. They're crying because they're happy, right? They're jumping up and down, doing whatever crazy thing they're doing. People don't care, right? In the town, that people come out in the parade. and it, It's fun to watch sometimes the cameras. They're like, this is the scene at this restaurant, right? At the moment. And then the moment the buzzer sounds, everyone, rah, jumping up and down, right? Pure joy, right? Expressions of joy. When the scriptures we've read in Luke, there's this theme of joy. Right? The announcement that Jesus has been born, that Jesus is, uh, is, has been born, and the announcements that Jesus is coming is a cause of joy. And people jump. They, they, even a baby, right, in the womb, jumps at the news that Jesus is coming. People break into songs. They're singing because this is great news. Um, in, in the story we read, it's, a, it's an incredible story that as Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, right, it says, the ba- she says, the baby in her womb weeps for joy, right? The baby that's in her womb, John the Baptist, Mary's presence, he hears the voice of Mary and knows, hey, this is, this is the Messiah's there. And just, he, she says, the baby in my womb is weeping for joy because you're, you're here, right? You're here. Um, and, and then Mary's first words when she speaks she's, uh, is that my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. There's a rejoicing in what is going on. And, th- and throughout Luke 2, when you think of the message the angels gave to the shepherds, um, what, what is that message? I always, I always hear the voice of Charlie Brown Christmas, right? When I hear this. Fear not for... Be- well, they have a different version, though. Fear not for behold, I bring you good news of... Great joy, which will be for all people. Great joy. Christmas is a message that we're celebrating of great joy. Do do you have joy? Are you filled with joy? That's my first question for us today. Are we filled with joy? Now, Christmas season, we can get so distracted, right? We decorate, which is good. I mean, I love, I love that we have so many talented people here. I love the way you guys do it. Um, we, get, we can get distracted, though. Decorating, Christmas jingles that are on the radio, buying gifts, um, good stuff. There's nothing wrong with these traditions. There's nothing wrong. But we can get so sucked into them that the, the question is, well, have you rejoiced that we're celebrating that God himself came into this world once a year? We celebrate. We've picked a date. It's December 25th. Again, we don't know if that's where Jesus was actually born, but just like everyone else has a birthday, and we celebrate it. We celebrate every year Jesus was born because it was a historic event. Jesus actually was born. God actually became man. And, and once a year, we celebrate that. It's the time when God sent his Savior to the world. Does that fill you with joy? Or as we talk about that, do we begin getting excited? Right? Are we kind of like jumping? It's like your favorite team has won the sports championship every single year, right? But it's way better than that, right? If your team won the championship last year, you still just jump up when they win it again, right? But every year, we're remembering something that's like, this is like nothing. I mean, this is comparing something that's insignificant to something that's life-changing, life-altering. Do we rejoice every year as we remember this news? Are we people who are rejoicing? Are we filled with joy, right? So Luke is a book filled with joy, beginning here in the story we read, even to the baby himself, John the Baptist, leaping with joy for knowing that Jesus has come. And Mary, as we said, begins her, when she begins her song, oh, one thing, you notice in Luke 2, there's songs. I'm calling them songs. She may not have sung this, hymns, praise, poems, whatever you want to call them, but Zechariah did this once, Mary does it, and then the angels appear singing. So, like, there's this response, right? There's this response to the message of, of rejoicing, and then the soul just overflowing with praise, right? So when you hear this message, and you know Jesus is Lord, and he's reigning, and you've come to know him, does your heart then just kind of burst in praise? Are you bursting in praise? Um, and, and Mary begins just saying, my soul is, I, I'm, my soul is magnifying the Lord, and my spirit is rejoicing in God my Savior. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, let's rejoice this year in what God has done. And I want to encourage us, um, 
Let's not hear this as like a, a legalistic, oh man, I don't rejoice. Pastor told me i got to rejoice. Why don't I rejoice? It's not the point, right? The point is, okay, if you're not rejoicing, let, let's take some time and, and let's really look at the message. I think if we're not rejoicing, it means we, we've, we're not really meditating upon what we're, we're saying. It's like, yeah, the Savior came. Wait, what did you say? Yeah, the Savior came. What? Yeah, he died for my sins. Wait, 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 what? Yeah, I mean, I believe him, so I'm going to go to heaven, right? What? <laughs> like, he died for your sins. You're free from them. You're going to get to be with him forever. They're actually paid for. You're righteous in God's sight. You are reconciled to God. And when you start getting ex- hearing that and you meditate on that, you start getting excited and rejoicing. You can't help but do it. So, please hear me. Um, what I'd encourage us to do is if we were thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not really rejoicing in God. Start meditating upon His promises. Start meditating on them, thinking on them. And as we do that, as we truly understand them, the rejoicing will follow. Right? Don't start with going home and saying, I've got to rejoice, I've got to rejoice. No. Meditate on the promises. Meditate on the promises. Meditate on the stories. And the rejoicing will come. Right? Um, So Mary's song, she begins saying she's rejoicing in God, and she gives three very specific, she gives three specific reasons in her in her song of why she's rejoicing. She's rejoicing because God has done great things for her. She's rejoicing because his mercy is to all generations. And she's rejoicing because he has fulfilled his promises. So the first thing she says is that she's rejoicing because God has done great things for her. Now, what was the great thing God did for Mary? The Holy Spirit comes over her, she becomes pregnant, and she has a child. Now, there's nothing in scriptures, there's a tradition that the Roman Catholic Church has that Mary uh, was forever a virgin and she never had other children. The Bible actually says Jesus had brothers and sisters, right? Um, so there's, there's no, she's young, there's no indication in scripture that Mary couldn't have children, Mary couldn't have children, right? It's a miracle, what, what is the great thing of having a baby? Think about it. Here is a woman about to get married that her, her fiancé actually considers divorcing her at some point. Um, Matthew tells us that. Joseph learns she's pregnant and says, mm, okay, but he's a righteous man. He wants to do it quietly. Um, but the, an angel has to, God has to appear to him and say, look, this is from me, right? This is the Holy Spirit who's done this. So uh, Mary is now a very young woman, and before she's married, she's already got a baby. Right? So what is the great thing God has done? The great thing, if we, if we understand the scripture, understand the story, the honored privilege that Mary has. That's right. See, all mankind is separated from God. Sin has separated us from God. And it, from Genesis it says, once, once Adam and Eve disobeyed God, now all men are born sinners. We all die. But God promised that he was going to save his people. Mm-hmm. He promised that, he, that the, the descendant of the woman, he said, you, uh, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. And then God gave promises to Abraham, to David, that David would have a king that would reign forever on the throne. He gave promises to Abraham that through him all nations would be blessed. And so all these promises, the prophets spoke of the restoration of Israel. All the prophets, prophets, what they spoke, all the promises of God, Israel was waiting for. And in Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of them all. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that in Christ... Uh, all the promises, all the promises of God have their yes. And so we say amen to God, right? So in Christ, all the promises have their yes. He's the fulfillment of all scripture. He's the fulfillment of what the sacrificial system ends up being done away with because of Jesus' sacrifice. He is the redeemer. And Mary was chosen to be the mother of God incarnate. What, what greater honor, what greater blessing could somebody receive? Blessing was that this, the Bible has lots of stories about women who couldn't conceive. That wasn't the case here with Mary. Right? In fact, she's put in an awkward position. The greatest blessing is that you now are the mother of, of God incarnate. When God incarnated himself, you got to be his mother. What higher honor could anyone have? And Bruno said, and that's right, this is the most important event that ever happened in history. Right? Most important event that ever happened in history, and you were involved in it. That's right. Um, 
So let's think of, again, these, this, these analogies are going to be so pale in comparison if you've understood what I'm saying. But it's like um, Will Chamberlain scored 100 points once in a basketball game. They say there was a couple thousand people there, but hundreds of thousands claimed they were there, right? <laughs> Why? Because if you want to see, claim you were there at greatness, right? Um, I, I was thinking of um, a, an example uh, just a couple weeks ago when the Cavs were in town, basketball fans, right? The Cavs were in town. And then I get on the internet and I find out they took the subway, right? And here's the part that really annoyed me. It was on a Monday. I was off. I was like, I should have been in New York, right? <laughs> I might have been on the subway. And, and on LeBron's Instagram, right? There's this guy beside him, like all scowling, like, please don't do that. Please don't record. And I'm like, dude, if that was me, I would have been like, hey, man, get <laughs> me on his Instagram account. And I, would have, I mean, I don't really use social media a lot, but I would have been on it that day posting, right? <laughs> like, look, look, I was on LeBron's Instagram, right? <laughs> he sat beside me. The guy's like, well, his elbows were swinging everywhere. I don't care, man. Like, <laughs> man, if he bruised me, I'd be like, look, look. <laughs> This is from, from LeBron, man. <laughs> right? uh, so why? What's, what's so cool about that? Right? What's so cool about that? It's just the presence, right? Um, uh, of, uh, maybe we'll have someone argue with me. My opinion, the greatest player right now that we got. So you, you, you have this, just the cool idea of the nearness of someone famous, right? Someone that, that, that's like, wow, look who that is. Now, pales pales in comparison to Jesus. We're talking about a sports figure who is good at what he does, a lot of other good things about him, but you know what, just being near him, would, it, that would excite me, like, wow, I met him. And it, there's no, well, what did I benefit out of it? It's like, no, no, I mean, I just, I met him, right? Well, Jesus, right? The Savior of the world, God himself, when he comes to save his people, Mary gets to be involved in that, and Mary is the one who was chosen to be his mother. Right? Wow. All generations are going to call her blessed for this privilege. Right? Do you see that? And I think sometimes I use that example, it's it's peanuts in comparison. It's not worth comparing to what I'm talking about. But we get excited about these trivial things, right? And you all under can I, maybe some of you roll your eyes, but you can at least understand where I'm coming from, right? But the comparison to Jesus. And we don't get excited about it. Right? Jesus, Mary was blessed for being involved, for being chosen for this high role. But God, God blessed Mary, but it's not just for her. Right? What does she say after she says, wow, I've been chosen for this? Wow, who am I? Verse 50, she transitions and she says, In his mercy, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God's mercy is extended to anyone who fears him. Um, fear in this sense, remember, it's like Proverbs 1. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, the Bible also says perfect uh, love drives out fear. So we've got to understand what we're saying by fear. Um, perfect love drives out fear in the sense of we're often afraid. What will happen to me? Will I have a job? Um, will I stay healthy? Um, does God really love me? Uh, and those are the fears. Perfect love drives out that fear. Where we trust in God as our Father. Right? It, it, maybe the vision in our head of, of God being a domineering dad. Right? No, that's not who he is. He's a good, perfect father. Love drives out fear. But there's another sense where the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it, it's fear in this sense. Fear that we recognize God is the creator of all things. Powerful. Right? The ruler of all things. To whom everyone must submit. Who's righteous and holy and perfect. And the judge and king over the earth. And so the fear of the Lord recognizes that, that if I were to come into God's presence, I need to come with fear and trembling. And that God cannot look at unrighteousness, cannot look at sin. So me coming into his presence as a sinner is a fearful thought, because he is the God and judge of all. So whoever fears the Lord, recognizing his sovereignty, his kingship, his right rule, that everything belongs to him, whoever will fear him and submit to him and give their life to him, he extends mercy, right? He extends mercy to anyone. And the scriptures talk all about that consistently through from Genesis to Revelation. In Revelation, there's a beautiful image that people from every tribe and language and, and nation and people are before the throne, like adoring the Lord. Right? Um, all people. So here at CCP, we got a good taste of that because we actually have people who've come from all different kinds, all different countries. 
speak different languages. And Jesus is, his mercy is for anyone who will bow down and accept him, who will say, Jesus, you are king. God, you are king. I am a sinner. And I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I'm going to bow my knee and say, forgive me, Lord. And his, he extends mercy. 100% guaranteed. He extends mercy. It doesn't matter. It's, he's not a respecter of persons. He used the, the phrase. He doesn't say rich or poor, right? Uh, it's not based on how, you can't say, it's not based on how smart you are. It's not based on how much money you have. It's not based on, he doesn't care your age. He doesn't care. All people are extended. His mercy is extended to you. If you have bowed before Jesus, you have mercy. He, and, and that's why he came. His mercy is to us. We are, we are sinners who are separated from God, but he sent Jesus into the world to do what? To save us. You know, Jesus becomes, means he saves. That's why he put the name Jesus. That's why he's given the name Jesus. It means he saves. So Jesus has come to save us and show us mercy. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Right? But as the psalm says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he separated our sins from us. So, brothers and sisters, my question for you is, have you received God's mercy? Have you received God's mercy? God's mercy is for you. 100% guarantee, if you will come and recognize Jesus as Lord, his mercy is for you. Do you know that you have received God's mercy? If you don't, I want to encourage you today, make sure you know you have received God's mercy. That is why he came. He came to give you his mercy. His mercy is being extended. He is calling out saying, come, receive my forgiveness. His mercy is for all. Have you received his mercy? His mercy is for, and there's one other cool thing I want to show you here. It says, and from generation to generation. Um, we pray for our kids before we send them off. Uh, for children's church. Right now, they're learning about Jesus, and we pray that they, that would be just see, um, that Jesus would be capturing their hearts, even now. Um, but it's from generation to generation. That means your kids or, or, or the children in our church, right? God's grace is for them. Right. And when they grow up and get old and have grandkids and they have kids, and generation to generation, God's mercy is there. It's extended. Until he returns, his mercy will be offered to us. Great hope. Great joy to know. It's for us, his grace and mercy. Um, and one other thing, just real quick, we'll show you what, what God also, we have an upside down kingdom, because if you look at his mercy for all, know what his mercy does. He contrasts the rich and the hungry, um, the proud and the humble. The scriptures say God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, right? So we have something upside. Look, we've all got to humble ourselves. And in, in Jesus, in his coming, he has said he is opposing the proud. He's sending them away. He's br he brings down mighty from their thrones, and, and, but yet the humble he exalts. Right? So if we'll humble ourselves and say, Jesus, I need you, he'll exalt us. But if we're proud and arrogant, we don't have problems, I'm going to rule I'm gonna rule my own little kingdom, God is opposed to that. His mercy is for us, but we need humble hearts. God is consistently opposed to the proud. And one other thing, he, is, he, he lifts up, the, he gives, uh, how does it say, he fills the hungry with good things. The scriptures are consistent. God loves the poor. He cares for the poor. And God has come to find the broken people. And he's filling them. But the rich, he sends away empty, it says. Now let's not over-spiritualize this. You could spiritualize it. But it also, there's a, there's a physical sense that God loves. And he has a heart for the broken, the poor, the outcasts, the widows, the orphans. Scriptures are filled with them. So I just say, I hear that some of you in this church have real hearts and passions for that. And I just want to encourage you to pursue that and help us as a church do that. I think CCP does a lot of great, but help us do that, right? So if you have a heart, like I'll tell you as a pastor here, like if that's part of your heart, great. Do it. You already have my blessing, and please bring us along and help us, right? We need to, as a church, imitate God's heart, caring for people, loving all people. So God, and if you have those passions and hearts, God's put it on your heart, right? And God's put it on your heart, not just for you, but to also help us. So we together can minister to our community. God's mercy is extended to all, and he goes looking for the least. Right? He goes looking for people who are lost. Have you received that mercy? And now are you showing that mercy to others? God's mercy is to all. And, and Mary ends her song by saying how this mercy that God has shown is in fulfillment of his promise. And we've already been talking about this, but you look in verse 54 and 55. 
He says, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. See, this is, and we were talking earlier, this is in fulfillment of God's promise beginning in Genesis and then promises down through Abraham, down through the prophets. God was going to redeem Israel. God was going to redeem his people. God had given them a kingdom forever. God had given Abraham the promise that you will be a great nation. All nations will be blessed through you. Right? David would have a king that would reign forever. And even in exile, when the Israel's exiled for their sins, they're promised they will return and that there will be a glorious day of the Lord. All these promises were made. And in Jesus, they are fulfilled. In Jesus, we have the true descendant of David. We have the king who is going to reign forever. We have the offspring of, of Abraham, that through him, now all nations truly are going to be blessed as God's plan. Israel is to bless the nations. Now in Jesus, all nations will be blessed. All the promises of God of restoration, even the future promises that one day God would put death to death, right? that would drive out death, it is now made possible in the death of Jesus. As Jesus will rise from the dead, he defeats death. In Jesus, all the promises have their yes. And, and, and Mary is singing, wow, this grace you have shown me, and this mercy you're now extending to people, this is, exact, this is in fulfillment of what you have been promising. In Jesus, God is remembering his promises to redeem a fallen, broken world. Brothers and sisters, have we captured this? Do, do, do we hear this? And if we hear this, what's our reaction? Are we not going to sing now? Are we not going to rejoice? Are we not going to um, jump? I, I said to the, the Latino group, we've got to be more Latino in this sense, right? Like, I grew up in an American church that was a little more like this, right? But like, right? This is like this heart is more like Latino, right? <laughs> you know, God has done great things. And we start getting emo we get excited. We start jumping, right? We start praising, right? And, and, I didn't mean to knock our... <laughs> Cultural expressions are different. They're okay. But, <laughs> um, but the idea is, however you express it, some of you are more expressive than others, but express it. Be joyful, right? Are we joyful people? Are we responding in joy? Because what? In God, in Jesus, all God's promises have been fulfilled. Christ has come to show us mercy. Christ has come to redeem us. Christ has come to pay for your sins. Christ has come to set you free from your sins. Jesus means he saves. God has come because he is Emmanuel, God with us. And now he is with us forever. He has gone to prepare us a place that now we will forever be with the Father. He has come so that when we die, we won't die, but we will live forever. That he will transform our bodies, that he will make us new, that we have now access to God's presence. We are children of God. We have been justified. We've been redeemed. He's sanctifying us. Amen. Jesus has come to do all these things. That is what his birth means. That's what it signifies. When we know this, are we going to sing? Are we going to jump? Are we going to get excited? Right? Brothers and sisters, let's be a people that's rejoicing, that's praising God for what he's done for us in the birth of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you came. Um, and Jesus, you came to broken people like us. And you came fulfilling all these promises that you are going to redeem the world. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that your name means he saves, that you have come to save us, that you are Emmanuel, you're God with us. Jesus, our hearts, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving. We're, we're filled with praise for what you have done. Um, with Mary, we say, our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God, our Savior. Jesus, we rejoice in you today. We, we glorify you. What great things you have done for us. Oh, Jesus, thank you for showing us mercy. Thank you for remembering your promises. Thank you uh, for coming. And thank you this year that we can celebrate this, that we can remember that uh, this is true and we are redeemed people. We are set free people. We are uh, people adopted and made your children. So Jesus, we thank you for all that this symbolizes, all this hope that Christmas means. God is with us, Emmanuel. Jesus, you have saved us. So we rejoice, we magnify you, we re our spirits rejoice in our God, our Savior. Amen. Amen.